Hello and welcome back to the uh, Virtual Eclipse Community Meetup. I'm your host, Stephanie Swart, and today I'm joined by two speakers, Emily Zhang from IBM and Heiko Rupp from Red Hat. Thanks for being here. Today's meetup is about building and monitoring resilient microservices with Eclipse MicroProfile 1.2. So without further ado, Emily, Heiko, take it away. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, it's, a, it's a great to be here. <laughs> So it's, a, it's my first time to be in a virtual meet, meetup. So, uh, so in today's talk, and uh, Heiko and I will be talking about uh, Eclipse MicroProfile with uh, emphasis on the fault tolerance and the metrics aspect. Uh, I'm Emily Jiang. I'm from IBM. I'm the MicroProfile development lead. Also, I. Uh, also is um, the spec lead for the um, config and for tolerance. Uh, so in the next hour, we will go through the whole Eclipse Micro Profile 1.2. So we talk about uh, uh, Eclipse Micro Profile uh, in a lot of conferences and etc. And uh, the first question is, uh, I mean, to finalize or reach a general consensus about what is a microservice. So I thought I just like uh, uh, generalize the, the concept about a microservice. So microservice is kind of small and concise service. Is that someone said this is like a SOA done right. Basically it's a small, and uh, very, um, I mean, easy to maintain and um, very easy to release. And uh, all the microservices are loosely coupled together and then build it together. It's like a, a Lego piece, and then you can build a uh, huge um, pattern with it. Uh, and uh, when we talk about uh, building microservices, I, I think is um, the first question people will ask, how can I build the best microservice? And how can I make sure microservice service is really easy to maintain and easy to release? Basically, we need some best practices. So it's a, you need to make sure the microservice is com configurable and also really res resilient. So basically, it's with a full tolerance aspect. And then you you want when you deploy your microservice in the you know, in the uh, cloud and etc. You would like to monitor it, so it's a kind of you will talk about monitoring as well, and also it's with the security as well. Uh, and uh, and uh, when you talk about microservice, I think is uh, people will have uh, the cloud in the picture, so it should work well in the cloud. It's uh, like uh, when you build a microservice, and uh, at first you you will test it uh, in, the, in your local machine, and uh, it should behave exactly the same when you deploy it to the cloud. And uh, how, to be, uh, how, to, how to achieve these best practices is very simple. Is um, the, the best way to do is to use the Eclipse macro profile. Let's have a look. The, uh, first, like uh, the, you need to make sure you write your microservice, but uh, it should, uh, I mean, uh, react differently in the different uh, uh, rental environment. Basically, you you can configure it and uh, without repackaging my, your microservice. So it's, uh, this is more like build once and run everywhere. It's not Java, it's microservice. So the way to achieve it, achieve it is to use um, micro profile config. And also, is uh, your microservice might have to uh, invoke another microservice. So in this kind of invocation, you need to build in some uh, aspect or for tolerance. What will happen if the uh, backend is not responding or is not reliable? You need to all consider this. How do you handle the error? How do you handle the failure, et cetera? And uh, also, is um, uh, when we talk about uh, deploying microservice to the cloud, and uh, you would like to check whether your microservice is still running. 
For example, you might deploy your microservice uh, to uh, uh, Kubernetes, and then is the Kubo can and directly like um, uh, check whether your microservice is alive or not. If it's not, and they can, uh, it can easily issue a command and to destroy it and then start uh, stand up another instance. So that's the health check. And um, we talked about earlier, and later on, Heiko will talk more about metrics. Basically, is be able to monitor microservice to see the whole well is it is performing. And also the security aspect. How do I secure microservice? And this security is quite easy to config. My microservice might go into another microservice, might be deployed in a completely different container. How can I make sure my single sign-on can pass through? So these kind of questions. And uh, last but not least, this is uh, like, like uh, how do I achieve loosely coupled aspect? So you use the CDI. And uh, how do I invoke a microservice, another microservice, and et cetera, you use JAXRS, and then the, the, the payload, JSONP, and et cetera. So all these uh, uh, requirements are being offered by micro profile 1.2. So it's um, the, the, the front, uh, the config for tolerance, health check, security, and metrics, all in the micro profile 1.2. And uh, CDI, JAXRS, and JSMP released in the micro profile 1.0 is also is took directly from the Java E7 and then grouped together to form a micro profile 1.0. But micro profile 1.0 include the micro profile 1.0 uh, uh, or this programming model. So next, I will hand over to Heiko to. Um, I mean, give you a quick overview about macro profile and uh, what's in the, I mean, some um, uh, basic about macro profile one or two. So Heiko, you can take over. So thank you, Emily, and uh, welcome from me as well. So the question is, what is Eclipse micro profile and um, why does it exist at all? Um, the first question is pretty easy. Microprofile is a set of specifications for cloud native Java microservices. So to make it easy um, to write microservices in Java, building on existing technology and um, in a vendor neutral way. So when a vendor implements microprofile, um, it's easy to port this application to a different vendor because um, that also um, supports the microprofile. The other aspect of the what is microprofile is that microprofile is a community of vendors, as I already mentioned, but also of users and user groups and individuals that are all interested in doing microservices with Java um, in a not platform neutral or vendor independent way that um, also want to leverage small deployments and um, the newest in technology. Next slide, please. So why microprofile? I mean, we already had Java EE, and I think this was not the worst. But if you look at this um, chart down here, you see Java EE was released before 2015. And um, since then, the world has changed a lot with the invention of Kubernetes, containers. Docker wasn't really a thing in 2014, just started. And um, now with Kubernetes and Docker containers and everything, the environment has changed a lot. And um, uh, the Java EE standard was not progressing to provide that. So a group of vendors, communities, and individuals have joined to define microprofile um, to basically take, take the opportunity to define the cloud native Java and make it available for everyone. Um, the idea is also to have a much faster innovation cycle and release cycle. So the, the aim is to have a release every quarter or around every quarter. Um, the first release was in 2016 and then a micro profile organization itself went to the Eclipse Foundation. That's why we're doing the this webinar today here um, on the Eclipse virtual hangout. 
And then uh, we started with a 1.1 release that just added config to the first 1.0 with the minimal Chucks RS, um, CDI and JSONP as Emily already mentioned. And then for Java 1 this year, we added um, the other specs that you will see in the next slide. And 1.3 is just around the door. Next slide, please. So these are the, uh, is the content of the MicroProfile 1.2 release. You see in, in the, the orange boxes, it's the content from um, micro, MicroProfile 1.0. The dark blue config got is 1.0 in MicroProfile 1.1 and got an update in MicroProfile 1.2. And in addition, we have added the health checks, metrics, fault tolerance, and JWT propagation specs. And this is what we are talking about next. So Emily, Thank your turn. Yeah. Thank you, Heiko. Yeah, so in the next few slides, we will talk about uh, the, the releases in the MicroPro 102. So the first, so this is kind of another different um, um, representation of the Eclipse Micro Profile 102. So it's basically, as Heiko has uh, explained earlier, so the whole Eclipse Micro Profile, we would like to provide a vendor neutral programming model. It's unlike a spring, so you won't be locked in by any particular vendor. So it's like uh, a WebSphere, Liberty, uh, Red Hat, Wildfly Swarm, Ampyara, and Tommy to 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 and Kumaluzi, EE, and et cetera. You can all move your uh, uh, microservice around. So they all uh, trying to support the um, Eclipse macro profile programming model. So the first one is the config. So the config is basically is kind of, is uh, the programming model to achieve the externalizing the configuration. So basically it's uh, you in your application, uh, and uh, you you can specify some configure configuration, and uh, also it's in the different runtime environment. Uh, it's free to like supply new configuration, but in your application code, you can directly inject the configure configuration from the underlying runtime. So in this way, like uh, if you move your up up a microservice around, you do not need to. Um, like uh, repackage your, your microservice. So it will be able to pick up the new configure, configure property. And then it's, uh, uh, so in this way, it's very flexible. Uh, the, so give you the more uh, background about this um, uh, micro profile config. So it's, uh, it's trying to achieve right once, run everywhere. So we use the CDI to inject a config uh, from the uh, underlying runtime. And uh, also it's portable across environments. So in this diagram here, um, you can see uh, the, the one, the, one of the major feature in the config, basically is all the config sources um, are layered. So they have priorities, so it's called ordinals. So all the configuration source have the um, uh, priority in this way, like runtime is able to order them. Uh, this is a diagram showing like um, how it works in OpenLibT. So in OpenLibT, you can uh, have, I mean, hard code your configuration in the micro dash config dot property. So this bit is same in every application server. And then you can overwrite this um, uh, configuration properties in this way, the username and password. And uh, you can put the username and password in the JVM options or bootstrap or properties or server.in. Um, uh, for example, in this example, is that you can later on configure your username to be Bob and password to be that, 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 that uh, um, few characters. And then, in your application, it will directly use the um, configuration specified in the JVM or options or bootstrap or property or server in It's because uh, the properties coming from this, uh, these higher resources, config sources, will overwrite the um, value in the uh, package in the file 
because that has a lower priority. The default priority is 100. So the JVM uh, options or bootstrapped or properties, which is a system of variables, which has uh, 400, um, uh, the ordinal number. Environment variable is having a default of 300. You can uh, you can uh, override this um, value as well. For example, if you say, okay, I would like uh, the, my environment variable to be 500, you can directly declare uh, ordinal uh, and uh, as a property config ordinal, and then it will become 500, which will have the highest priority among these um, uh, three resources. So this is, uh, as you can see, and also you can supply uh, any additional config sources uh, like Zookeeper and etc. It's very extensible and very easy to use. You can use the injection or you can use the programmatic lookup. You can do a config provider dot config, get a config and etc. So this is a um, uh, macro profile config. So in the next few slides, I will talk about um, uh, fault tolerance. So it's um, uh, talk about how to build a ro robust microservice. And uh, basically, it's, um, in the fault tolerance, um, in the micro profile fault tolerance specification, we introduced uh, a few annotations, like uh, asynchronous, which means uh, can, you can invoke the method asynchronously or invoke the uh, backend service asynchronously. And then also retry. Um, in the retry, you can specify the, the delay between the retries or max mark retries or max duration for all the retries. And then also timeout. Timeout is uh, to uh, prevent from the indefinite wait. Is when you invoke the one backend, if that one is not uh, responding, you don't want to uh, I mean, wait forever. So you can specify timeout. Specify timeout. And also the circuit breaker. The circuit breaker is kind of a little bit um, difficult to understand, um, and uh, but you need to understand from the electrical um, um, perspective. Basically, the circuit breaker when it's open, so that means uh, uh, the the client will not be able to invoke the service. So it's a, it's it's similar to, uh, to the electrical circuit. Circuit, and with the close, that means the invocation can can uh, continue. The circuit breaker is kind of prevent from uh, uh, frequent. Uh, I mean, repeating timeout. Basically, if the backend is not responding, you is no point to keep on invoking the backend. And uh, at some uh, like you can configure some uh, uh, algorithm to say, okay, if uh, if it's a, there's a 10 consecutive uh, invocation, if five of them failed, I don't want any request to go through again. So this can be easily achieved by the circuit breaker. And also the bulkhead. The bulkhead is another um, kind of tricky term. Basically, you have to understand from the ship um, perspective. Basically, it's kind of originally the term came from the uh, shape industry, so it's um, uh, it's a uh, it's just trying to prevent is the uh, one um, uh, counterpart from flooding the whole ship. So it's uh, basically is um, uh, each uh, um, compartment is kind of sealed. So in so this bulkhead is uh, kind of prevent from one failed um, I mean um, method uh, operation is eating up all the resources and etc. So it's give you allocate uh, kind of limited number of um, resources. So this is bulkhead. So there's the two flavors of the bulkhead. One is the semaphore flavor, the other one is the multi-threading. So it's a semaphore, you can directly say bulkhead 20 means um, at most 20 concurrent requests can go through. If you use a synchronized bulkhead, and then um, a value equals 20, waiting task Q equals uh, 30 or something like that. This is the thread pool. Basically, it's, uh, all the invocation will be on the separate thread. Uh, last uh, but not least, it's really important to have a fallback um, 
uh, functionality. Basically, it's, uh, uh, if you invoke uh, backend, that backend is no responding, you would like to fall back to alternative uh, service. So this is a full, full back. So I will go through the um, uh, uh, go through the each individual um, elements uh, in the next few slides, and uh, with a quick demo, so so that you can understand a little bit more. So basically, uh, one thing I would like to say is um, we defined um, uh, these uh, uh, specifications, but uh, our um, bottom line is to make uh, this specification really easy to use. As you can see, these are all annotation based. So very, very easy. You don't need to read uh, like 100 pages or the, uh, the instructions about how to use them. So in the next few slides, I just uh, like uh, demonstrate uh, uh, kind of very simple two microservice. So microservice A and trying to invoke microservice C. Considering if the microservice C is not uh, reliable, maybe in this uh, like uh, four invocations, you you can get uh, one successful um, uh, result. In the older way, you can just do a, a, a for in loop, as you see, and then and then you get uh, some uh, good service back. And then you can easily, so as you can see, is kind of this clutter code, is kind of boiler code, and you do not want to it kind of mix up with uh, all your business lo business logic. So what you can see, you can directly use a retry. So you can directly say at a retry and call service C. It will, on the I.O. exception, it will uh, retry. And then this is a retry um, at most five times. And then each retry will have a 500 millisecond delay. And uh, also, it's, uh, if it's a kind of, there's a very slow service uh, C, but you don't want to um, uh, wait. For like uh, for example, is uh, responding in five seconds, but you kind of uh, impatient. You don't want to wait for five seconds. If it's two, if it's uh, not responding within two seconds, you want to uh, go somewhere else. So you can directly add annotation at uh, timeout two thousand millisecond. So the default um, time unit is millisecond. So two second will timeout. So and then it's a kind of you can uh, like uh, limit some resource like uh, with a bulkhead. So it's a kind of is the default is uh, ten. So it's a ten thread at most uh, ten concurrent request can go to uh, service C. And the next is the circuit breaker. Circuit breaker like uh, uh, when you invoke service A, invoke service C is only can go through if the circuit is open. And uh, uh, if the circuit is closed, if it's open, it's, uh, nothing will go through. So it's, uh, you can configure the circuit breaker um, uh, like, uh, to uh, protect uh, the, uh, it's kind of monitor the uh, bridge between service A and service C by using add circuit. So it's, uh, if the is a fail on so you fail on the IO exception, and then is with um, for example your circuit uh, is um, uh, open, and then and then you want to it won't stay open for forever, and uh, uh, it will have a grace period which is uh, computed by delay delay five hundred millisecond, and circuit will test the service C again. So we will let one um, uh, client invocation to go through to see whether service C is responsible, re responsive. So this is the um, uh, circuit, circuit breaker uh, annotation. So I, earlier I mentioned the fallback. So it's, uh, uh, if it's uh, one microservice calling another one, the, the, the backend is not responding. And even though with like uh, you can even though with like uh, retry and and etc is still not responding, and you can do the fallback. Uh, the fallback uh, you there's a two uh, two thing two flavors to specify fallback. At uh, the one flavor is uh, to use the uh, handler. So it's uh, you can say add fallback my fallback dot class. So you can 
um, create a dedicated handler like a map fallback to like uh, to direct the invocation to the handle method. Uh, it will not like in this example, it will not uh, call into a service C anymore. We will directly go through the handle method instead. Uh, with all the fault tolerance, um, annotation, etc., you if you have heard of the Istio, you might uh, be wondering. Uh, Istio Istio can also, uh, I mean, provide some uh, aspect of the fault tolerance. Uh, and uh, as you all know, um, Istio was um, um, well uh, was uh, founded by IBM uh, and. Uh, Google and uh, also Lyft. I think a uh, little Red Hat also joined. Um, and uh, it's a kind of uh, anyway. So it's um, uh, ECO can offer the fault tolerance um, like retry, timeout, and uh, circuit break, uh, and some aspect of bulkhead. And uh, however, if you deploy your microservice uh, with some fault tolerance um, uh, built in. And uh, then you deploy this microservice to Istio. If in your microservice you say, okay, in that uh, service A call into service C, I do three retries. And uh, also in the Istio, you configure the for tolerance, also do a three retries. You will end up doing uh, nine retries instead. So this is a kind of this is a kind of conflict. So how can we uh, how how can we deal with this kind of uh, kind of not a nice ecosystem uh, to begin with? Uh, like the first attempt is uh, trying to like uh, make them to work in isolation. So uh, this microservice with fault tolerance with uh, um, uh, micro profile fault tolerance uh, built in when it's deployed to Istio, you can choose. Uh, uh, maybe just use the Istio support tolerance, and uh, you want to switch off the micro profile for tolerance. Actually, the micro profile for tolerance provides this capability. So you can just uh, set up one um, uh, config property, and uh, and it will switch off uh, all the um, all the grid out one, the retry timeout and circuit break and bulkhead. Um, uh, except a fullback, fullback. The reason is uh, you still cannot provide a fullback capability because fullback uh, can only be supplied by the um, application devo developer because it knows the application the best. So it's uh, uh, in this way, like uh, this is uh, will not be conflict. Uh, however, if you don't use the micro profile for tolerance, uh, if you use like uh, Hystrix, directly use a uh, Hystrix or Failsafe or some other third party libraries and uh, directly build in your application, you cannot uh, use that um, uh, third party lab library and uh, you still use for tolerance um, policy together because there's no way to be able to uh, turn off that uh, for tolerance aspect if you directly use a third party for tolerance libraries. So this is the first step uh, for this Istio uh, and micro profile integration. There's more um, uh, to be um, uh, investigated to I mean, build a better ecosystem. So we had some initial discussion. I think it's, we are going to look at each individual um, spec and to see how to best to make it two things, so two technology work together. So uh, I will um, have a quick um, demo about uh, fault tolerance. So I talked about, um, uh, I talked about uh, service A calling to uh, uh, service C. So, so I would like to quickly demonstrate this um, uh, two microservices deployed to the uh, OpenLibty. So, uh, which has a full implementation of the micro profile um, uh, window to release. So, in in the service A, I directly call into the service C. So, basically, the um, uh, 
the designs uh, I have the proxy service C proxy and the service C um, will call into the uh, into the real service C proxy proxy will call into the uh, back end of the service C so I can directly inject the property service C dot URL into my uh, into the service proxy where did that uh, declare this service C dot URL um, configuration property. Emily, I don't know if you meant to share with CU. Oh, really? Oh, my clips is um, how do I share my clips? Just select screen sharing and uh, then select the desktop with the clips on it. Okay, let me see. Screen share again. Or maybe one sec. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Okay, now. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Oh, thank you. When I click uh, um, escape, and then it's stopped the screen sharing. Uh, so earlier I said that the, um, uh, the, let me show my screen again, show the line again. So it's uh, uh, basically the service A, uh, directly call into the service C proxy. So the service C uh, proxy um, uh, will call into the real uh, service C. So it use the JAXRS client, is a client to, I mean, and then to grab hold, of, get hold of the service C URL. So, and uh, we use the micro profile config directly inject service C dot URL to the service C proxy. Uh, where did I define the service C dot URL? Is in the pom.xml. So basically you can specify the, the, the bootstrap property here. And then it's the kind of that we use a, a, a web client can directly connect to the service C uh, endpoint. So, I, you can see this is very simple. So basically what uh, service C does is uh, kind of directly is um, suppose uh, some um, uh, endpoint uh, to display uh, the uh, properties. So this is a service C. Service C only has a one method is get property. So it will display property. And service A just call into service C and to get a property. And uh, uh, in this example, the service C is really, um, a service C is, um, is really uh, not reliable. So I can see, so this is uh, like, a, I code it up. So service C as a one time successful, and then second time uh, is failed, and the third time is successful. So how can I make sure my, like uh, when the client come to service A, uh, I can display the result, successful result all the time. So I can serve the request um, uh, very nicely. Um, so this can be uh, achieved by macro service, uh, by the um, uh, <laughs> macro profile for tolerance. So basically, what I can say here is a service C dot get a property. I can say, uh, I can do a retry because and sometimes it's a successful and some, sometimes it, it's a doesn't. So I can say uh, retry on the IO exception. Maximum is uh, like uh, five times. So I save it. And uh, with the OpenLipsy plugin, it automatically uh, build this change and then restart it. So restart the application. So now I'm back here. If I do refresh the page, so you can see it's always successful. So the second demonstration I would like to do is, for example, in the service C, uh, it has different mode. So sometimes it means um, it's sometimes fail, sometimes um, uh, successful. 
and the other another mode is slow. If it's slow, it means it will sleep for some time and then return the response. So for example, it will uh, sleep for two seconds. So for example, I don't wish to wait for that long because it's um, it's quite slow. So I can I, I can say. So this is uh, slow. So I, I can demonstrate is uh, is slow. Give you two second. See, as you can see, is is uh, will take a uh, long and then to come back. So if I if I am uh, impatient, I say. Okay, don't let me wait for for a long time. I would like to do a, uh, I would like to just wait five hundred milliseconds. So you can just uh, just do like that. Just say time out five hundred milliseconds, and now. Uh, You will get a timeout exception because it didn't return the result didn't return within like a, a, it's a 500 millisecond uh, and then it's, um, uh, with this you can easily like uh, you can do the fallback for example uh, I'll just directly copy so you can specify uh, I mean what kind of fallback um, um, policy is so in this way so the fallback you can directly declare on this method or you can create uh, the handler so in this one I can directly uh, written a prop myself from uh, my own application instead of uh, instead of calling the service C so I can do now if I go go to my URL and uh, refresh See, you can see it's a kind of fallback to your uh, to the service A's implementation of the get property. So this is a kind of very simple demo to demonstrate um, um, how to use um, micro profile for tolerance. And uh, hopefully you have uh, learned, uh, I mean, how easy it is to, to, to use. And uh, I will pass the handle over to Heiko. Let me stop my screen share. You can. Okay, you can take away. Oh, okay, no. thank you, Emily. So, um, yeah. you should see the, the slides now again. Um, I'll talk about health check. And as Emily mentioned already at the beginning, um, with these scheduler systems like Kubernetes, um, you as a human don't want to know about. Um, just your applications, if they are up or not or healthy, that's everything that the system does, but sometimes you need to help, help the system. So Kubernetes has something like a health check com, uh, concept where you have a readiness probe and a liveness probe, and Kubernetes will ping your application with this uh, defined liveness probe. To I see go. We it, actually yes. can't see the slides, sorry. You, I sh it should sh share, well, okay. I made a mistake. Uh. Okay, Perfect. let's let's do it in, in small. Sorry. Um, so basically, the system will ping you according to some rules, and if your application is not responding or responding with an error code, it will um, kill the running container and start a new one that's hopefully um, alive, and if you think about it, I mean, it sounds pretty brutal, but this is what ha people have been doing for ages when the application had a memory leak and the vendor was not providing a fix in a timely manner. They just stopped the application and restarted it and were hoping that another node in the cluster would take the load while the first one was restarting. And uh, within MicroProfile, we have the, <coughs> the health annotation and this defines a health check. Um, the method the class needs to implement is health check interface and then within a, um, a method that uh, responds with a health check response, you basically say, okay, it's up or down. 
And uh, you can also provide additional data. I'll show that in a minute um, in the IDE. And before I sh switch to the IDE, um, let me also talk about metrics. Um, exposing metrics in Java has been there for ages over JMX, but unfortunately, in the very early stars, JMX was um, there was no remote JMX defined, um, so every vendor had a different way of addressing that. This has been fixed in in Java six, I believe, um, with remoting JMX remoting capabilities. Um, but there is still the current world is revolving a lot about uh, other formats. Um, JMX is Java specific, so it's it's not easy to pull that data in from within curl or just uh, from uh, systems like Prometheus and so on. So uh, MicroProfile has def uh, decided to define its own metrics endpoint where data can be exposed. And um, there are three standard sets of scopes. And one of the set is the base scope. And this base scope is always there for each vendor. It has a number of 10 plus required metrics that each vendor needs to expose for, for the micro profile implementation. Um, these uh, include JVM memory, garbage collection, uptime, threading, uh, class loading, CPU usage, and others. Then there is a vendor specific scope that um, each vendor can populate as the vendor wants. Um, this is obviously not portable between vendors. And then there's a third scope uh, currently for applications where the application code itself can expose data. This can happen uh, in a drop wizard metrics like API or um, via annotations that um, are then processed via some CDI magic. And as of micro profile 1.2 and also the upcoming 1.3, uh, data is exposed in JSON format or in the Prometheus text format. And um, also additional metadata is exposed because metadata is uh, what makes your admin the life easy. So if you just return foo, um, a property foo with a value of 42, you don't know what it is. Is it shoes? Is it meters? Um, is it milliseconds? So this is why we're also adding um, a lot of metadata for this. And um, here, and I'll also show that in, uh, in code quickly. Um, you basically see on the left side two of the annotations, uh, timed engage on some methods. And then on the right side, if you do a curl for slash metrics, you get this output, which is obviously shortened. Um, for the base column, we, we show um, the base metrics, so the CPU stats or the memory stats. And then under the application co column scope, we see the application metrics that have been uh, defined on the left side. Uh, that's JWT, so let me switch over to uh, my IDE. So here is some code. First, this is a, well, let me go to the health first. So this is the health check, as you have just seen. Um, you have the health annotation, implement the health check interface. And within that interface, um, you create a response builder, give it a name because you can have many of those. And then um, you either say, okay, my outcome is good. So a life is up then my builder or it's down. We add some additional data and then we return um, the build. And I can just curl. And you see here, we have, um, this is the, the response from my Wildfly Swarm server, but uh, on Open, Open Liberty, it will uh, show the exact same. So we have here, an array of checks, which is only the one that I've shown above. And then there is the total outcome of all the checks that have been performed in the system. And this is up, so it's good. And we are also, where is that? Uh, we are returning a 200 okay, 
even if I don't see it. So um, Kubernetes knows that the system is healthy and will not con uh, kill the container. I could now switch that over to unhealthy, but um, let's skip that and go over to um, the metrics part here. And as I said, it's um, possible to create um, metrics the hard way a little bit like in code, but it's also what you usually do um, just by injection. And you can have either um, a metric like this, where you inject the new counter. Absolute equals true means that the, the name is taken literally, either provided in, in the annotation or just from the field. And then the description is metadata. Counters are um, um, dimensionless, so that we are good here, or can be dimensionless. And then we have a, a JAX RS service method here. And if we want to know how often it's called, we just add a counter with add counted. Um, can again give a description, the absolute one. And then also a list of tags or labels, which is a concept also coming into play a lot into Kubernetes because when you have an application, it uh, its services may run wherever on the, the cluster where Kubernetes chooses. So you cannot really say, okay, um, on node X in this container, it's always um, my application. The container can be restarted as we just learned. So um, it could live somewhere else. And also Kubernetes can just decide to reschedule that on a completely different node. So um, tags are something that are a concept, a base concept to identify applications and application parts. So it's possible to have global um, tags, but also here on a per uh, metric one that are then exposed. And then the last one, the monotonic flag, that's a bit of a tricky one. Um, if you don't provide it, the counter will count uh, parallel executions of this method. And after it returns from the method call, it will basically decrease again. So if you want to have like number of calls into this method over the life cycle time of the container, you need to set monotonic equals true. And this is actually a part where we are asking the community for feedback if we should keep that and be like the drop wizard metrics annotations that have introduced that, or if we uh, should choose the sem uh, switch semantics here um, to be more of what people expect. And now if I want to get um, a timing information um, on how long the invocations ta uh, take, I can just go like at timed and then um, micro profile metrics will do all the magic and expose the quantiles and, and everything. So let's have a quick curl call here as well. Actually, I can. No, I can't in this shell. So if I do that, you see we have um, a lot of applications here in the base scope that I have mentioned. Um, we have applications in the ven uh, metrics in the vendor scope, but we don't have the applications um, or uh, the metrics in the application scope yet. I need to quickly go and um, change that in the sense that I need to call my application. And then when the application is registered, I can go again for the um, for the metric call. And here you see then all the application metrics show up. Um, here for another method, you see the, the timing information with the quantiles of the timing, um, some counters and so on. I'm not going to more into detail here, but um, instead go back to the, the slides and talk about our last topic, the JWT propagation. The Java Web Token um, is an authentic authentication and authorization system based on tokens that you can receive from OAuth and other open API and so on providers. 
This is um, specified in one of the, the RFCs, uh, I think 7,559 7, or so. And um, this allows microservices now to receive such a token um, and decode the contents. So make sure who is the caller, what roles does the caller have, and basically deal with that in a way that people are already used in the, the Java EE world uh, with all these get principle and caller principle and what not calls. So um, this is, and the, the good thing is that the microservice itself does not need to know about um, all the users and roles and things. I mean, of course it needs to react on it, but does not need to have to the, uh, the connection to the authentication system. But um, the JWT um, standard is taking care of that. And this, Microprofile JWT um, propagation is making sure the token arrives at the endpoint and it's easy to digest with the from within the application. And with that, I'll hand over to Emily. Stop sharing for the last slide and final notes. Uh, okay, the last slide is uh, res is useful resources. So you can see that this is a, uh, there's a, a lot of resources um, we put it together to, um, I mean, educate uh, uh, developers, Java uh, developers. I don't That's think it's not, live. It's not live. You cannot. Turn on and see the slides. Oh, okay. Yeah. Here. There we go. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So we put uh, some um, useful links uh, here um, for the Java developers um, uh, to uh, learn about a macro profile. So macroprofile.io website. And uh, actually, we encourage uh, everyone of you to join the discussion and to share our ideas as well. And also is um, there's some information about openlifty.io uh, about um, how to use the micro profile uh, programming module like a config, a bot tolerance, and et cetera. And then also the one thing I think uh, Heiko also put a wildflyswarm.io. And also in September, we did a um, uh, uh, Eclipse um, newsletter which is the macro profile focused. So, so is the, this, the, this, the third link has a quite a few articles regarding the macro profile um, uh, technology, uh, macro profile programming model, and also about this community. So I think with that, so we will just uh, close it uh, out and uh, ask for questions. You're muted. Am I muted? No, Stephanie was muted. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for uh, that awesome demo, both Emily and Heiko. So now we'll go over to some questions. Um, so from Ali on YouTube, uh, our first question is, it's a kind of a two-part question. So the first part is, are microservices and IoT the same thing? And is access and microservices also the same? So on the first one, I would say, no, they are not the same thing. IoT, Internet of Things, is um, where a lot of small devices like mobile phones or even sensors are talking to backends. Um, microservices can be a huge part of these um, backend services where they run in the data center in your Kubernetes cloud and where the sensors talk to all these microservices where um, the systems like Kubernetes help you scaling them out and where then systems like fault tolerance make sure that the microservice is not overwhelming other microservices or your database in the backend and where metrics help you diagnose the load on the systems and to better plan for future growth of your IoT uh, environment. For the second one, I did not completely understand the question about this comparison. 
Um, and so it's is X A A S and microservices also the same? No, I will just uh, try to answer the second one. Is uh, I add a little bit more on top of what uh, Heiko has said. Is the micro profile is kind of the established programming model for writing your microservices. It's not about uh, uh, I mean the, the uh, this sensor uh, to control uh, some signals. It's basically, the best practice is to develop microservices. So the second question is: uh, Is the micro is the micro profile is trying to uh, find the best practices for you to write Java-based microservices? So is the micro profile is a programming model for writing Java-based microservices? So basically, the, is trying to help Java developers to de develop microservices. Awesome. And the last question is kind of on the same topic from Tamara. And she asks, how does this solution apply in the IoT space? Uh, I think is um, this can be nicely applied in the IoT space. Is that uh, IoT can control the microservices. So basically, you, if you use the micro profile programming model to define your microservice, Make your microservice to be like uh, for tolerant and manageable, and uh, I think it will work very well in the IoT um, uh, environment, in the IoT concept. Awesome. Is, yeah, it's a it build the best breed of microservices for you. And so that's all the questions that we have for today. I would like to thank Heiko and Emily for coming out and doing this awesome session. Um, and we will see everybody next year with Dan Heidegger presenting on Eclipse Open J9, Eclipse's own JVM. And with that, uh, that's a wrap. And take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.